Hello, I'm Mike Sheehan. This year I'll be presenting a series of open mic programs here on Fox Sports in which I'll interview some of the personalities of AFL football. Tonight's program features Tom Harley, one of the game's most respected captains who led the Cats to their first flag for 44 years in 2007. Tonight Harley talks about his intriguing journey through 11 years at two clubs at AFL level and his long distance relationship with the woman he will marry later this year. Harley has been a key figure in the emergence of the Cats as one of the game's most powerful clubs and is one of football's most articulate voices. Enjoy. Coming up strongly. Oh. Welcome to Fox Sports, Tom. Thanks, Mike. Those who uh, should know say the pain of premiership defeat never goes away. Are they correct? I think so, definitely. I, it's funny when you look at the premiership of 07 and 08. I, it's a strange one. I think the, I guess the feelings, the sort of euphoria of the, the high and the low, I think at this stage the, the, uh, the feeling of the low outweighs the euphoria of the high, which is, uh, which is a bit interesting. So it certainly was something that's pretty hard for us and, and will be forever. Have you uh, bothered to watch the game since? <laughs> I haven't. No, I haven't. I've seen, obviously, um, snippets of it. But uh, it's a strange one for me because I don't have much recollection of the game at all. Do you, do you know what happened to you that day? I mean, it was a big hit. We all knew. But a lot yeah. of people at the ground weren't quite sure what happened. No, I still don't really know. I've, I assume it's a clash of heads. It was, uh, uh, from what I've been told with Mark Williams, it was nothing sinister at all. Just um, we were both in the contest and it was off the ball as such only because the ball had spilled out of the pack that we were in um, and then it was lights out basically. Now you came back on but have you got any recollection of I mean, what sort of state were you in when you actually were sent out again? Yeah I wasn't in, I wasn't in a great state. I, I, uh, that was right on half time and then there's total no recollection at all for probably the next uh, 40 minutes um, and I do remember vaguely floating around at three quarter time and and then again going on in the last quarter, but not necessarily what actually happened. Um, did you fumble the opportunity, as most people think, or did just Hawthorne outplay you? Well, that's a, that's a tough one. Again, it's a bit hard because I probably should watch the game in that regard. Um, probably a bit of both. I think you wouldn't get anyone argue that Hawthorne played a brilliant game. Not only just a brilliant game, but a pretty pretty superb final series. Mm. They, they were probably the best team in September. Um, and we, we had been for the previous four months. One more question on, yeah. on, uh, on that day. Um, Gary Ablett, I thought he should have won the Norm Smith. Yeah. I'm sure the Geelong blokes did, but did you, you have a view about that? Did you see enough of it to have your own view? No, probably not, but um, uh, it's just the way it goes. I think um, very tough to pick a Norm Smith medalist from a losing side. And at the end of the day, we, we lost by a fair margin. Mm. You know, we lost by five goals. I think if you looked over Brownlows and Norm Smith and all those sorts of things, there aren't too many best on grounds from a player whose side's been beaten by five goals. He's, he, without a doubt, has all the attributes of a Norm Smith medalist and a Brownlow medalist. So, um, you know, hopefully his time will come. And he, the emotion, I think, that he probably showed after the game and that, that week was more a reflection of not the fact that, obviously, that it had nothing to do with Norm Smith, but that he'd, he'd left it all out in the park. And he, mm. For those players that are sublimely talented, he puts he puts in as well, um, which makes I guess it makes elite players elite that they've got the got the ability, but also work work their guts out. And he he was just spent. Is he at his peak? Do you think he's peaked yet, Gary? Oh, jeez, oh, that's a tough one as well. He's what is he? Twenty four. He's twenty four, going twenty five, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if he hasn't peaked, it's that's probably pretty scary. I think mm -hmm. he's. It, even even what he's shown through pre-season this year suggests he's going to have another fantastic year. Um, so I hope he hasn't, to be honest. I bet you do. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but to ask any more for him is is just is probably being a bit unfair. And I think Bomber summed it up really well a couple of weeks ago. He just said, look, you know, someone asked the same question. They said, let's just let's just enjoy what he's doing at the moment. And whether he gets better. That'll be great too, but um, let's not let's not sort of put any caps on him because okay. he's doing some pretty good stuff at the moment. Let me take you back to Port Adelaide. You had my memory is you had about five minutes on the ground in your solitary game. You had one. <laughs> I thought you were going to say I was solid in that game. <laughs> <laughs> one kick, yeah. one goal, and the chop. What happened yeah. at Port Adelaide? I probably wasn't mentally ready for it. I, I didn't. I, I didn't feel I belonged. I, uh, whether I was physically ready is, a, is another question. But by the time that second year round, when I played my one game, I, I did think I was ready to go. Um, Struggled also with uh, 
the balance between the SANFL and the AFL. I was playing at Norwood, a really strong SANFL club, and really couldn't even get a game there. So I, I couldn't push my case to play AFL footy when I'm playing SANFL reserves. In fact, that one game I played in the AFL, I went uh, played SANFL league. The next week I played in the AFL, got dropped to the SANFL league, and then the following week was in the SANFL reserves. So I played in three levels over three weeks, which is um, probably not great for your development. You played in one final in five years uh, uh, when you are well into your yeah. tenure at Geelong yeah. and the club was struggling. Um, where did you think you and them were going at that time? So I'd, I came to Geelong when I was 20 and, and was able to sort of, uh, I guess, get a spot on the side pretty early on um, once, I, once I made the crossover. In those early years, I think any player would say that, that if finals came, we played in finals in 2000, which is my first year, and we lost uh, an elimination final and. Yeah, you're disappointed, but you're, st- you're still probably just happy playing. You know, you've got a career, your career's going forward. Um, and then it wasn't until, I guess, 2004, so we had that gap where we didn't play finals, um, where it was frustrating, but still, you're still fledgling your career. You're still mm-hmm. probably thinking about yourself first, as opposed to the, the team. And as you hit your, you know, your mid-20s, you're 24, 25, 20, you start to think more about club and, you know, your team's set, in the, your individual spot's set in the team. So then, uh, okay, I'm, I'm comfortable with where I'm at, but the club's not going any good. Um, so that's when you start to think. And, 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 you know, we had some years in 04 and 05 where we played some good finals. Um, and 06 was probably the year where you really, you know, you put the club first and thought, well, where are we actually, where are we going here? We've played 100 games and we're not going anywhere. Well, there was a particular day that encapsulated uh, that contrast you were yeah. talking about before. You were at Princess yeah. Park, yeah. played Carlton early yeah. in 2004, yeah. and they towelled you up. And I remember listening to you on radio after, it was on 3AW. Yeah. I don't know how you got the microphone, but you were interviewed and there was a very strong, passionate sort of address about this footy club needs to sort of have a look at itself and pull itself out of the mire. Yeah, that was. I do remember that game. Myself and Matty Scarlett were 24 years old and had played 91 games each, and were the two most experienced players on the on the park. So we had no 100 game players, um, and we promised a lot that year. We uh, I think we came out and won the first couple pretty well, but then absolutely passed by Carlton. Mm. And I think that was probably a time for me when you did start to put the club first. That uh, okay, I'm actually really passionate about being a Geelong player, and um, you hear to. I guess everyone's there to play finals at the end of the day. And um, the club was, you know, through Brian Cook and Frank Costa, definitely moving in the right direction from the, the dark sort of 99, 2000 mm. era. And it was up to the, the players just weren't delivering. Um, and, uh, and that was, yeah, culminated that day. We were just absolutely terrible. That was probably, the, I think, the day that unofficially you stood up and, and sort of emerged, not selling yourself, but you, people saw you as a future captain that day? Yeah, perhaps. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've always felt really comfortable in my st- standing within the playing group. Um, I still think, I still do think when I was appointed, it was probably still a bit of a shock to a lot of people, but um, maybe not so much internally. Does that rile you, this, this, I don't know how broad the perception is, but a perception among some that uh, you're a captain, but yeah. you're not a great player. Now, I, I don't subscribe to that, and I'm not saying that because yeah. I'm facing you across the table, <laughs> but... It, there's, that perception exists, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and and it, no, it doesn't. It doesn't roll me. It, uh, I'm comfortable with my playing career, um, and you know we've had some some great sort of spoils in the, the past couple of years. I think it was uh, it was it was just a catch cry as much as anything else. It was um, it was always just sort of said. Tom Harley, captain of Geelong, not you know dot dot dot, not the <laughs> club's greatest player, but that's that's okay. We've got some pretty. Pretty good players on our side. You have. That's, there's no shame in being not yeah. being the best player at Geelong. But I, I also think that um, it, it also sort of it, it did spur me on a little bit as well. Like I, I think um, a lot of athletes would say, when there are doubters out there, you, you do get a little bit more out of yourself. And I've certainly touched on that. You played one game as captain. Yeah. Injured your finger Four and points. missed. I think perhaps as many as eight yeah, games. About eight games yeah. And came back uh, via the reserves. Now, my memory says that you weren't particularly happy with that decision by Bomber to bring you back uh, in the early game. No, that's that's. I, I was always happy to play the first game in the reserves. I, I found that uh, that perhaps um, you know you got to get your touch and, and things like that. I tend to be a touch sort of player. You know, the ball and read the ball in the air and things like that. Um, and I, to be honest, whether I was whether I was ignorant or not, I. I, I just assumed it would be the one game, you know, I'd, I'd play the, you know, 80, 90% of the game and get a few touches across mm-hmm. half back and take a few marks and and then go straight in the week after. But um, uh, that didn't eventuate and um, I, th- I did find that pretty tough. It was definitely a, 
a test for me early in my captaincy that um, uh, you know I hadn't necessarily done anything wrong. The opportunity to lead my side, which I'd just been appointed to lead, was um, taken away from me. Did you broach the subject with the coach? <laughs> not, not so much. I didn't. It was, it was. I guess they, they. I think um, uh, speaking to the coaches since, and you can always sort of reflect on things that they actually found it quite tough um, because. Uh, because I, th I think that you know they did respect me as a, as a player and a person, and it was it was quite simple really. The the side was up and going, and um, we'd won about four or five on the trot, and and uh, he was, you know, the, all the coaches were really honest. Just said, you know, at the moment there's just not a spot for you. So the following week after the twos, um, we were as I said, we went over to Port Adelaide, and, and I was an emergency, so I was overlooked basically. Back in Adelaide too. Back in Adelaide, yeah, it would have been nice to play. Um, and uh, it was it was a, it was a kick in the guts, no doubt, but it was also a pretty stern reminder that, that that we as a club were going forward with a culture where no one's above anyone else, whether you're the captain or player 42. You mentioned Matty Scarlett, and I, I remember interviewing once for a story, and he said in his own words he thought he was a 50% better player when you were in the team. Oh yeah, I mean that's really nice to hear that. First, firstly, I think um, I, on Matty Scarlett, I unashamedly say that he's the best player that I've. I've seen best or well, best defender, I should say. I've heard, you know, and we were thrown in the deep end as twenty-year-olds when, when, uh, as I said, the club were giving games to younger guys, and we were playing full-back and centre-half-back for probably a hundred games. But we played a hundredth game together. It was a really special night, and uh, we'll be mates forever. Um, very different people for the people who know both Matt yeah. and I, but uh, we've definitely got a, a bond on the field that um, you know we just seem to know know what's going on. Lots of people saying that the game. Is becoming soft if it hasn't already become soft. Yeah. Uh, as a man who's out there, yeah. Have we? Do we get it wrong? I mean, is it still as tough as it's, as it's ever been? I, I think the best way to answer that, I'd challenge anyone who says that to sit front row yeah. on ground level and just just have a listen to the have a listen and have a look at the velocity of the hits. I think, sure, there's the cheap stuff's been taken out and the, the bumps are grey area at the moment, but the actual intensity at the footy. Um, We've, got, we've never had better and more powerful athletes playing the game. Um, and the hits are as, as big as ever. And I, I mean, I've, I've had plenty, and the grand final was just an example of how things, you know, an innocuous hit, but it was just done with so much force, can, uh, can render you useless for the rest of a game. And, you know, the, game, the game's not soft. It's, it's definitely magnified, it's, it's officiated a lot better, but it's certainly not soft. After the break, Harley talks about who he thinks should succeed him as Geelong captain and the love of his life. But when football's your job, Tom, can you still love it like you did as a kid? Yeah, you can. You can certainly love the, the game. Uh, I um, uh, missed the first NAB Cup game. We played Adelaide. It was 10,000 people at Telstra Dome. And, you slugged it out over summer, but then once you get into the rooms and the guys are doing the warm up, and I couldn't help but get out on the ground and kick a few balls out in the warm up, just because you, you love the game. You, you, at the end of the day, we're fans, but uh, there are certainly certain aspects, not so much the playing and training side of things, but the the scrutiny, the um, I guess the sacrifices and compromises you have to make with lifestyle, those sorts of things that perhaps can take the fun out of it. I talk to players who are adamant, look me in the eye and say that they get no joy out of football from Monday morning until when they play their game yeah, right. because of the build-up, because of the intensity and whether it'll work, whether they'll win, whether they'll play yeah, okay. well. Do you, can you relate to that? Uh, not so much. I, I enjoy the... I really do enjoy the... Um, I do enjoy training. I do enjoy... I'm a bit left of centre. I enjoy meetings and, and things like <laughs> yeah, that. You are left of centre. Yeah. And, uh, but I... Um, I just... I mean... To say that you don't enjoy it from Monday to Friday doesn't resonate with me because you're with your mates or you're with your mates all week. Like we we often joke around in the Geelong change rooms, but just what an amazing workplace, you know. It's two o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, yeah. you're sitting in the spa with Ryan Gamble and he's telling you stories about whatever. Yeah. Uh, I live in Torquay, you know, it's 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 brilliant, you know, it's it's twenty minutes from Geelong and half the teams here, isn't it? Yeah, uh, the older guys are. Yeah. Scarlo's down the road and uh, Joel Corey and, and Lingy. It's um it's it's a real a, a fantastic lifestyle. We obviously train hard and play hard, and but to sort of put the key in the door and uh, and open up the, the windows and look out at the beach is pretty special. How do you let your proverbial hair down? <laughs> <laughs> Not as well as I used to when I had it, Mike. Um, I guess I just relax like everyone else. I love music. I, I, I 
try and play a little bit, listen to a lot. Who um, do you listen to by uh, choice? By choice, I like rock and roll music. Um, uh, you know, sort of Oasis and Radiohead, and you know, and then grungy sort of bands. Or it's probably a little bit. I went to a gig actually last night, and um, at uh, a punk rock gig, and I was so I'm 30, and I'm there with all the 20 year olds with the skinny jeans and the sleeve of tats. And Got any safety like. pins? No, no, no. So I'm, I'm probably I'm probably the uh, the antithesis of the, uh, the the punk rock listener, but I, I do enjoy that sort of music. Um, I guess to relax, I'm in a unique situation where my fiance lives in Sydney. Um, and that takes a lot of, uh, one of a better word, takes a lot of energy to, to keep that relationship going in terms of obviously phone calls and emails and, and that kind of stuff. And then any spare time when we can actually get our timetables together, that's, that's bliss, you know, that's the way. So it, how, how regular uh, is the contact? It's, uh, oh, contact's non-stop, but the actual, we, we'd see each other, I'd say three out of four weeks, mm-hmm. three out of four weekends. She's a trooper. She, for a Sydney girl with no, AFL knowledge, affiliation whatsoever, um, has just really embraced. That's what love does, Tom. Oh, apparently mine. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about Felicity. We're talking about Felicity, uh, yes. Who's your fiance, yeah. and she's the editor of uh, Women's Health. Women's Health, she'd be happy that you give that a plug. <laughs> Explain to me how the editor of a women's magazine in Sydney becomes engaged to a Geelong footballer. So we've been together, what, two and a half, nearly three years. And before I worked at Women's Health, I was the deputy editor of Cosmopolitan. And every year I had to do the um, shoot with the hottest players of NRL and AFL. And I came to Melbourne and Tom was the AFL player and just kind of progressed from there, really. He sent me a text after the shoot and said, if you're ever in Melbourne, um, let's meet up for a drink. And I said, oh, I'm never really in Melbourne. And I hadn't actually been to Melbourne for four years before that. And then I just so happened the week after to be in Melbourne. And here we are. Here we are. You've got a, a high powered job and he's a captain of an AFL team. How difficult is it? How frustrating is it? I, I won't lie, it's not, it's not easy. It's frustrating when you come home, when you have a really bad day at work, and you just want to come home and vent or you just need a hug. But I think, we just make it work. We know it's not going to be forever and we know that we really want to be together and we just we just make it work. And I think the key to making it work is just communication. Like we make sure that we really speak about our feelings, how we feel about it, each other. And in the future, I think we, we're really upfront. Okay, what are we going to do here? What are we going to do there? Um, and just have lots of options in place. Now, when you do finish, yeah. uh, the captaincy becomes vacant. Yeah. Lots of talk about Joel Selwood being a, a captain in waiting, but he's yeah. only young. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure people like Cameron Ling and James Bartell would be looking at it, and yeah. Gary Ablett. Yeah. Um, you don't have to sort of ordain the next captain, yeah. but have I missed uh, any of the contenders? Would you think that, is it too soon, say, for a Selwood to be in, in the mix? Oh, uh, that's a tough one. I, I reckon, um, I think the captaincy now, it says a lot about the individual club, um, with the captain they appoint. Not, and from my experience, it's become a, a really holistic job where you're not only captain of the, the footy team, which perhaps was in the, in the, in the you know, 10, 15 years ago, you're, you're captain of the club, so you've, there's a lot of extra commitments that, that um, Joe Blow wouldn't actually sort of know about. And I, I found in my experience, as a, I think I was 28 when I took on the job and had uh, a lot of playing experience and also oh, world experience, I guess, that you, the coping mechanisms were there. So. Um, you might get a standout like Joel Selwood or um, uh, you know, Wayne Carey or John Worsfold or something like that, but to be honest, I'd be more inclined to, to pour, push it towards um, a, a, an older player. As far as candidates, we've developed a culture now where I think there are some really good candidates. Um, Cameron Ling's been my vice-captain and was Stephen King's vice-captain for years before that. Um, Joel Corey's probably one, a guy that doesn't cop enough uh, kudos for the work that he does uh, at Geelong. Everyone, he, no doubt he's a great footballer, but uh, he's been elevated to the deputy vice captain role this year, um, and he's got uh, those those qualities. And then you know Jimmy and Gary and a few more, so it's uh, it's nice. Have you been towed up from start to finish in a day when you just no matter what you tried, yeah, it just didn't work? Uh, yeah, yeah, oh, th- oh, definitely. I mean, um, I was really disappointed with my game in the qualifying final against St Kilda. Um, wasn't necessarily an individual opponent sort of tell you up, but you just had a bad day. Mm-hmm. You, you just had a bad day. Um, 
Corey McKernan tore me to shreds one day, absolutely tore me to shreds. And uh, he kicked, I think, four on me in the first quarter. And, you know, this is when Wayne Carey was up and about and he was in my face. And I was a young, you know, bright eyed kid just thinking, geez, what's all this about? Do you see Wayne Carey's walked over to Tom Harley and held four up and said, that's four on you, I think he's kicked. Yeah, sure. You've played on a, an amazing variety of players in your career. Yeah. The tall guys, the smaller guys, yeah. quick and, and uh, not so quick. Yeah. Is there one that you have particular difficulty with? Well, it's, it has definitely changed. I, I, um, my role within the sides changed. I used to play uh, centre-half back in the day where centre-half back was a position. And, yeah. um, and now you're just part of a back six. So we, we, we tend to rotate a lot now. Um, back in those days, it was, uh, this was um, when Richo used to just play as that power forward and covered so much ground. And um, Similar to what Nick Rewalt does. He was always, I've always found him a really challenging opponent. Um, but my first ever game for Geelong was on Darren Jarman um, in 1999 and he I kept him to one goal for the first three quarters and he kicked five and a quarter on me so he has a habit of doing that yeah, yeah. as someone sort of pointed out he'd done it in grand final <laughs> so I wasn't too bad about it there's a perception that when you do finish at Geelong be it at the end of 2009 that some people have speculated right. on or yeah. later yeah that the next day you'll be off to Sydney yeah. to live up there is that uh, is that the plan uh, it's, oh, it's certainly on the cards uh, I mean we've got to sit down I guess and see where it where it pans out um She's worked really hard over 10, 12 years to, to have a career. Um, at the end of this year, though, we're, we're getting married in October. And, um, you know, if I play on, we're, we're not going to do the long distance relationship as, as a married couple. So she'd, um, you know, we'd have to explore the opportunities of her moving here or, or whatever. So we'll, we'll just we'll, we'll play it by ear. And um, to be perfectly honest, we don't really know what, what's, what's going to happen. Um, but uh, I'd enjoy the, the challenge of, of moving to Sydney and, and living in the state. I know the AFL are excited by the idea. I mean, would you think when you finished playing that you'd see yourself going in the direction of uh, administration or a, sort of an ambassadorial role or even West Sydney? I mean, yeah. I know you won't live in West Sydney. But, but, <laughs> why, uh, why do you say that, Mike? <laughs> I, don't think, I think it's more Rose Bay. All oh, right, OK. Well, yeah. Flissy yeah. lives in Rose Bay. <laughs> yeah. So, but I mean, would, a, would an active involvement in Sydney, has that got some appeal to you? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I think whether I like it or not, um, footy is what I know from 12, 13 years in the game and, and, uh, and, and also love. So um, definitely uh, if an opportunity arises there, I'd, I'd be more than interested. I, I don't think um, coaching is necessarily my kettle of fish, but I do have a, a real interest in um, the management side of things. and, and it, in my position in the past couple of years, this uh, development of leadership and culture about, you know, not necessarily just footy clubs, it could be sporting teams or, you know, big corporations. I, I, I really enjoy that facilitation sort of process. So I've, I've, I'm going to keep my options pretty open and um, we're in a bit of a credit crunch though. I might not get a job anywhere. <laughs> might, have, might have to play long 40. <laughs> I've enjoyed the chat, Tom. Good luck for 2009. Good on you, Mike. No worries. Thanks. Thanks.